Hey everybody, this is your Art Appreciation Teacher Dottie, and today we're going to talk about the theme of the ideal. Now, the ideal speaks about total perfection of whatever it is that we're viewing, whether it's a human figure, whether it's a tree, whether it's whatever. Now, hopefully I don't have to tell y'all that there actually is no perfection. Uh, also, many artists throughout time have been trying to identify what the ideal would be. Let's take a, a look at this first image here. This is from the classical Greek era, which uh, was about 500 uh, to 100 BC. Uh, the Greeks at that time, the classical time, were interested in ideal perfection as they saw it. They uh, were the first artists to uh, do images of uh, the nude human figure. And when we examine these, uh, for instance, this is the um, Venus de Milo. And, of course, her arms got cut off when she fell over, you know, throughout the ages, something like that. When we look at the classical, there is no possibility that any human has these uh, types of proportions. They actually came up with formulas about things like the uh, human fig, the size of the head, uh, in pro uh, the size of the head and the human body should be eight and one half heads tall. They came up with all kinds of proportions for the uh, distance of the eyes apart from each other and things like that. I'll show you those later. For right now, I just want to give you an idea of, of what things look like and the kind of things that we're thinking about when we see these. The next image, also classical Greek, we see classical Greek. We see that uh, I believe this is Aphrodite, again in human proportions, but also in these uh, sculptures at the height of the classic period. They were interested in trying to portray motion, uh, that is, energy of the human body, the uh, ability to move around, to be lifelike, as you can see in the, like the, uh, the pose of her hands, her legs, her knees, uh, one foot above the other, just as she's about to take a step, things like that. Next, we have a symbol of male uh, ideal proportions, and this is called the Apollo Belvedere. We see very uh, lifelike uh, pose, action, again, no relation to the human, the r actual real human form. I mean, look at how long his uh, thigh is down to the knee. Impossible. And this Im image here is by the uh, Renaissance artist Botticelli. In the Renaissance, uh, which started in Italy, and it was a time that artists were looking back toward classical Greek and Roman artwork uh, and copying it, trying to look through the lens of classical Greece and see the the ideal proportions and things like that. This is Venus emerging from the sea. Uh, she is said to have, in mythology, she's said to have floated in on a seashell. On the left, you see the winds blowing her ashore. And on the right, you see the right, you see a wood nymph who is about to cover her with a beautiful cloak. An image here, also from the Renaissance, shows their idea of a beautiful woman of that time period. And wow, look, she's holding a little bitty unicorn. Ooh. 
Here we have a very symmetrical image of things the left balance out or are identical to things on the right. Look at the columns over on the left and the right. Totally identical. The sky in the background is giving us some negative space that we can uh, kind of gives the woman some breathing room. Look at her um, her left arm and the velvet sleeves that she has. You see how big and wide they are. They balance out the little unicorn that's over the uh, velvet behind her, behind the uniform of her other sleeve. It is said that the most attractive faces, human faces, are ones that are symmetrical. Symmetrical, balanced in their proportion, but what was thought beautiful in the time of the Renaissance was totally symmetric uh, human forms. From ancient Egypt, we have the uh, head and shoulders portrait of the Queen Nefertiti. Uh, again, another classic example of perfection and beauty. This is from the Dutch Baroque times of uh, from the artist Vermeer. It's called Girl with a Pearl Earring. We're seeing her uh, face depicted in a three-quarter view, which is, which is super hard to do if you're trying to draw that. Her eyes and lips are really jumping out of the composition. She's almost looking at us, confronting us as the viewer, the audience. She's probably one of those paintings that if you were able to walk around it, her eyes would seem like they followed you around. Really scary. Look at the lustrous blue of her headscarf and the beautiful gold uh, as it cascades down around her shoulders. The very luminous uh, brown cloak that she's wearing, shiny, velvety, the crisp white uh, collar, everything perfect. And the little beautiful, little beautiful luminescent pearl here also hanging from her ear. In the United States, a famous portrait painter named John Singer Sargent uh, did many portraits of wealthy people, beautiful women. She's very smug. She's very satisf satisfied, wearing beautiful clothing, beautiful furniture. Uh, you see that she has like a canvas backdrop, uh, maybe some curtains, things like that, with beautiful decorations upon them. Now, here is one thing, though, that's really kind of weird that you don't really notice, and that's over, the, over on the left side, on the upper side, you see the curtains, they're kind of segmented. They're not symmetrical, as you see in the classic era, the Renaissance. Maybe he's giving a hint that all is not well in this household because uh, they got a little little showing that's not real pretty, kind of a little showing what's behind the scenes. Degas here, uh, let's see, late 1800s, showing the Paris Ballet in a beautiful ballerina lit by the stage lights. She appears to be glowing, uh, total perfection. In every way, I don't know if y'all took ballet classes as a child, you know that you certainly, you know, couldn't do something like that. What's weird, though, is over in the center to the left, there's a man standing watching her. And you can see some feet of some other people. Maybe he's backstage. And uh, some of the other ballerinas are getting ready to uh, come out and perform. You see right above her head, you can see uh, a dancer with a tutu. And she's, got her, and she's got her feet into that pose. I don't know what you call it, but, you know, that impossible pose is what I call it, of her feet um, that shows extreme facility with ballet movements. 
Here's the famous fashion photographer uh, of the uh, mid-century United States, Irving Penn. Again, even though this is a human form, it's a photograph, fashion models have never looked realistic to us. But here she is centered in here. Uh, Her clothes are almost a silhouette, which brings out the detail in her absolutely perfect face. A total icon for mid-century America was the ideal beauty of Marilyn Monroe. In this image, the pop artist Andy Warhol has uh, taken a a newspaper photograph of her that is uh, an image that has been reproduced in a newspaper, magazine, some type of print media. And he's overlaid it with a technique of printmaking that's called silkscreen. I'm sure lots of y'all have some silkscreen t-shirts. This method of uh, printmaking was thought to be uh, very common, very non-artistic, because it was used in commercial applications. And artists said, well, it's not real. It's layering one thing over another, and you have what's called registration errors. That's where printing one color did not not line up with another color. You see, like on the right side, you see her hair has got that yellow shape not quite matching up with the black eras. Uh, and you see, uh, I can tell that it's a was a photograph to start with because of what's printed in the black ink over here. You can kind of see the photographic origins of it. The intention that Andy Warhol, in doing these Marilyn Monroe series, was to show the artifice uh, that the world had taken on, the idea of beauty, and how unattainable it is. Uh, it's only, uh, it's only success- successful in a minor part because you see they've attempted to idealize her with all of these heavy, heavy cosmetics and all of this wild hair color imagery right here. Here's an interesting kind of funny thing. I always wondered what was up with these kind of paintings of cows because you know I love cows and everything, but I found out what it is. In the 1700s was when they started really concentrating cattle breeding. And they came up with most of the breeds that we know today. You know, the Herefords, the Shorthorns, things like that. They would have uh, portrait painters come around, livestock portrait painters, and paint their animals. They pay a lot of money for these paintings. So they wanted to absolutely make the most of this publicity campaign and show their animals. And as you can see, animals are grotesquely out of proportion. There's never been any kind of reality like this. This is an image of a uh, a steer here called the Lancashire Ox. And... As you can see, gigantic. He's got big fat deposits at at his back end, heavy chest, all that kind of stuff. And you can see his uh, lifestyle, that the farmer is dressed pretty fancy. And he's uh, throwing out corn cobs for the, uh, the steer to eat in a pretty little wicker basket. And just shoving them down. You see, he's got some kind of conveyor belt thing going on so that the steer is able to really shove it all down. Another example of a a very famous bull, one of the foundations of the shorthorn breed, was a bull named Patriot. You see again, same crazy, unreal proportions. And this time, what's down in the lower corner, and he's super tiny. Super tiny. And his little dog, little faithful dog sitting there also. Perfection uh, also evidenced in horse paintings. 
Uh, same reason. These uh, these have been done later. Um, those uh, cow paintings are like uh, 1800s, and this was more like uh, probably 1900s. Here you have a horse, beautiful horse, but man, look at his neck and the crest of his neck. Impossible. And when you look, start looking at it, you go, man, that is so out of proportion. Gah. Impossible neck. I mean, it, it's like the neck of a llama or neck. I mean, it, it's like the neck of a llama or something. It's so long. And I don't know about y'all. Uh, I'm sure lots of y'all are more f familiar with horse uh, anatomy and conformation than I am. But I don't think the way he's standing on his rear legs is possible. And of course, his tail is way out of beyond belief. Here's another one. This is so pretty. I just love this. Again, this uh, incredible tail, ridiculously long tail. His uh, neck and his crest of his neck, they're more, they're, I'd say they're kind of um, authentic. Look at the beautiful road he's on with the beautiful paddock. Beautiful trees framing him, him. Beautiful sky framing him. Pretty red clay track. Oh, that'd be so nice and soft on his feet. And beautiful dappled uh, shadows and sunlight over here on the bottom to totally complete this perfect picture. Now, y'all horse people, look at, this is something I just can't, can't, uh, can't get over. Are his fetlocks like impossible, impossibly delicate? Surely they are. Surely at least this one and this one that are touching the ground, a horse it doesn't look like that.